Muy buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos a esta primera jornada del ciclo de conferencias sobre litigios societarios. En un memorable estudio publicado hace ya casi 20 años, el profesor Luca Enríquez pasó revista a 106 decisiones del Tribunal de Milán con agudo rasero académico. Sus hallazgos causaron estupor entre los veteranos jurisconsultos de ese país. La tierra de Brunetti y Galgano y tantos otros autores citados hoy con mayor frecuencia en Colombia que en Italia tenía a voces del profesor Enríquez un derecho de sociedades de calidad cuestionable. El problema no era tanto el contenido de las normas sustanciales italianas, ya de por sí algo anticuadas, sino más bien su defectuoso desempeño en sede judicial. Esta circunstancia obedecía en parte a que las reglas de procedimiento en disputas societarias parecían haber sido concebidas deliberadamente para ahuyentar a cualquier posible demandante. Pero el problema iba más allá de los códigos procesales. Las sentencias comprendidas en el estudio daban cuenta de un cuerpo de magistrados agresivamente formalista, desentendido por completo del impacto económico de sus decisiones y lo que era aún más preocupante, diferente ante la expropiación de accionistas minoritarios. Aunque el estudio de Enríquez ciertamente avinagró los ánimos entre la magistratura milanesa, sus conclusiones alentaron un proceso de reforma que permitió con el paso de los años enderezar el rumbo del derecho societario en Italia. Colombia debería tomar ejemplo de esta experiencia italiana. Si bien nuestro sistema de litigio societario es decididamente de vanguardia, con un buen número de jueces y magistrados entendidos en estas materias, Aquí también pueden sentirse los síntomas de la enfermedad milanesa identificada por Enríquez. Para comenzar, los empresarios que se presentan ante la justicia deben transitar por un sistema caótico y de contornos imprecisos. Doce años después de que la ley SAS introdujera la figura del abuso del voto, seguimos debatiendo si esa acción debe llevarse por la cuerda del proceso verbal o del verbal sumario, un asunto en el que las opiniones de nuestros jueces y magistrados cambian al inicio de cada ciclo lunar. Aunque en una sentencia recientísima la Corte Suprema de Justicia optó por la vía del proceso sumario, es posible que al momento de terminar esta transmisión, esa posición haya sido refutada ya por la misma Corte o incluso por algún tribunal superior, como ha ocurrido tantas veces en el pasado. Algo ciertamente más preocupante viene pasando en el caso de las medidas cautelares un instrumento judicial que ha perdido relevancia en litigios societarios por interpretaciones agresivamente formalistas del Código General del Proceso. Atrás han quedado los tiempos en que el derecho de sociedades era terreno fértil para medidas innominadas de la más diversa índole. Hoy no es posible siquiera solicitar embargos en procesos societarios, una desafortunada restricción que ha promovido tendencias paulianas en algunos demandados. Pero tal vez la principal dolencia del sistema local sea el divorcio absoluto entre nuestras reglas procesales y los postulados económicos del derecho de sociedades. No de otra forma puede explicarse que el sistema de litigio societario colombiano tenga por característica principal un pronunciado desbalance en contra de accionistas disidentes y expropiados. Todo empieza por la legitimación en la causa. Como la mayoría de acciones legales debe dirigirse en contra de la compañía, los accionistas que controlan la administración pueden financiar su defensa con recursos sociales, una prerrogativa que, por supuesto, no está al alcance del demandante. Esta desigualdad económica suele volverse insuperable cuando se obliga al demandante a asumir los gastos, a veces astronómicos, de acudir a instancias arbitrales, aún en contra de su voluntad y hasta en las disputas más elementales. Para rematar definitivamente las esperanzas de disidentes y expropiados, sus demandas deberán prepararse casi a ciegas, con las minúsculas migajas de información que puedan obtener mediante el uso de las herramientas procesales disponibles. Y aunque algún demandante lograra sortear con éxito todos estos obstáculos, tendrá finalmente que enfrentarse a una jurisprudencia que varía en forma impredecible, dependiendo del foro al que se acude. 
De ahí viene entonces la necesidad apremiante de reformar nuestro régimen de litigio societario. Con esta reforma debe procurarse en esencia que los ritos procesales colombianos estén correctamente alineados hacia la solución de los problemas de agencia propios del derecho de sociedades. Dicho de otra forma, y lo decimos explícitamente arriesgando excomunión, deben estudiarse los efectos económicos de las reglas de procedimiento vigentes para asegurar, como lo ordena el Código General del Proceso, la efectividad de los derechos reconocidos por la ley sustancial. Este será el objetivo principal del ciclo de conferencias que inicia hoy y que abarcará todo el mes de agosto. En estos foros, organizados por DLA Piper Martínez Beltrán, el Centro de Estudios de Derecho Procesal y el Instituto de Análisis Societario, académicos y practicantes de diferentes países discutirán el impacto económico de las formas procesales en el contexto de conflictos societarios. El día de hoy contaremos con la presencia de distinguidos académicos, comenzando por el profesor Luca Enríquez de la Universidad de Oxford, quien dictará la charla inaugural, seguido por el profesor Amir Licht de la Universidad de Herzliya en Israel, quien nos hablará sobre el impacto económico que ha tenido la Corte Especializada en Derechos de Sociedades de Tel Aviv. Para terminar la jornada, el profesor Larry Hammermesh de la Universidad de Pensilvania nos explicará cómo funcionan los estándares de revisión judicial en el foro societario más prestigioso del planeta, la Corte de Cancillería de Delaware. Para la segunda jornada, la próxima semana, hemos invitado litigantes internacionales que ejercen ante las cortes especializadas en Ámsterdam, Tel Aviv y Delaware para que nos ilustren con sus experiencias prácticas en esos foros. En la última sesión, el 26 de agosto, tendremos el privilegio de oír a dos de los más reputados expertos en derecho societario colombiano, Néstor Humberto Martínez y Francisco Reyes Villamizar, quienes abrirán una jornada en la que un grupo de practicantes y profesores colombianos presentará algunas ideas para una reforma del régimen de litigio societario en Colombia. Ese día también haremos un importante anuncio sobre el concurso de derecho societario organizado en este momento por la Universidad de los Andes. Y los organizadores del concurso me han permitido darles una pequeña chiva. Las fechas del concurso han sido ya definidas para el 6 y 7 de noviembre de este año. Planteado en estos términos el debate, tal vez podamos aspirar a una reforma diseñada de consumo entre nuestros expertos en derecho societario y procesal, algo que rara vez ha ocurrido en más de dos siglos de vida republicana. Con ello será posible superar por fin aquel diagnóstico lapidario de Gavino Pinzón, posiblemente inspirado en los escritos de Roscoe Pound, según el cual el desarrollo escrito de las sociedades comerciales es menos anticuado y menos malo de lo que puede afirmarse. Sus mayores deficiencias están en los desarrollos prácticos de los principios que lo informan. No hay en el derecho societario colombiano otra tarea más urgente que esta reforma. Tengo ahora el privilegio de presentarles a Luca Enríquez, profesor titular de Derecho Societario en la Universidad de Oxford en Inglaterra. En la larga carrera profesional del profesor Enríquez debe destacarse su paso por las universidades de Boloña y Harvard, siempre en altas plazas académicas, así como su distinguida trayectoria en el servicio público italiano, además de comisionado de CONSOB, el regulador financiero de ese país. El profesor Enríquez trabajó tanto en el Ministerio de Hacienda italiano como en el Banco de Italia. Sus publicaciones incluido el estudio sobre el Tribunal de Milán que ya hemos mencionado, se han convertido en piezas de obligatoria inclusión en currículos de derecho societario tanto en países de tradición civilista como del Common Law. En su discurso inaugural, el profesor Enríquez nos hablará acerca de los atributos esenciales que debe tener un sistema de justicia societaria especializada. El profesor Enríquez hablará por aproximadamente... 25, 30 minutos y una vez concluida su exposición, si tenemos tiempo, vamos a transmitirle al profesor Enríquez las preguntas que nuestro público haga a través de la plataforma de YouTube o que nos envíe a través de cualquiera de los medios disponibles para tal efecto. Entonces, como ya lo dije, un privilegio presentarles al profesor Luca Enríquez. 
Luca, welcome to Colombia. The floor is yours. Muchas gracias, Jose Miguel. I, I really enjoyed uh, your uh, introduction. I, I cannot go on in Spanish myself. I hope you won't mind. Uh, but uh, uh, it was um, uh, definitely flattering. And uh, I will try to uh, be uh, up to the expectations that you created with the, your introduction by reflecting again, as you mentioned, on a topic that uh, for me is very important because coming from um, civil law and jurisdictions, I have always been fascinated by the way corporate law cases are decided uh, in Anglo-Saxon jurisdictions. At the time when I wrote uh, that article that you cited, I was uh, only familiar with uh, uh, Delaware uh, case law. Uh, later on in, in life, because I became uh, the professor of corporate law in, in Oxford, I managed to get some um, uh, insights into English uh, company law and, and its case law. And uh, it's very different from, from the US one, of course, as, as people uh, will know. And it's, it's fascinating to, to ask oneself uh, how these two different uh, regimes can still be very effective in regulating companies. My reflections today will, uh, uh, in a way, uh, try and uh, make sense of these differences in, in an implicit way, because I, I will be, and, and now I will try to, to launch the slides, uh, I will uh, be quite uh, theoretical in my approach, I will, theoretical so to speak, but uh, I will not give you examples. I will go through a uh, talk that, that is really about what makes uh, uh, a good uh, corporate law judge. And, um, and so in order to answer that question, one has to first ask generically what makes uh, a, a good uh, judge with no further qualification. And uh, in, in, I think that the, the, there are three main uh, attributes for a good uh, judge or four. So integrity and independence are of course key, uh, as obviously the judge has to be able to master the law. And uh, finally, um, it, it, a judge judge should uh, aim to promote uh, the social good while uh, striving to do, it, uh, do so, uh, while, uh, deciding in favor of those who deserve uh, to, to, be, to prevail based on the fact of the case, and uh, striving to strike the right balance between judicial activism and uh, deference to lawmakers work because we are uh, most of us live in a representative democracy so it's for the um, parliaments to make the laws so uh, to be a little bit more specific in, by integrity i mean not only uh, being uh, in, in the habit of refusing bribes but also having uh, of oneself uh, the perception of being ultimately a civil servant, where the, the emphasis is on servant and the idea that uh, a judge provides a public service. So uh, the, the role of a judge is to solve disputes uh, and that is a service for, to citizens and to uh, organizations. And, uh, uh, of course, in doing so, the judges exercise a power of the sovereign state. But they should always understand, and, and that's not something I observe, for example, in my own country of origin, where I am currently now, Italy, um, they should understand that uh, exercising a power of the sovereign is not the essence of their function. It's a, it's a means, it's a tool to make it effective, but it's not the essence of, of the function itself. And, and therefore, they shouldn't see themselves as um, 
power bearers. They, they, they should see themselves as servants. And, and together with that the idea of, of service goes the, the idea that the law itself, again, uh, um, saying what the law, law says from, from, from judges, is the law itself is a social construct that uh, serves society's needs and, and not the other way around. It's, it's not that society serves the law or anyhow is uh, underneath the law. It, it is in a sense, but the law itself uh, is meant to help us uh, be, uh, be uh, um, fairer, uh, a richer uh, and uh, uh, better society. Uh, independence uh, is um, also very important. Judges are for sure everywhere part of the country's elite. But uh, what I would say is that in countries where the, law, the, the jurisdictional function works uh, well, judges tend to perceive that themselves as part, not generically, of the country's elite, but part of the legal elite and actually at the top of the legal elite, which has to be, in order to function well, somewhat separate from the a country's uh, elite uh, to core. Uh, and so the judges values and the reputational concern should be contained within that social sphere, meaning that they have to worry about the reputation within the legal elite, not with, within the elite more generally, and, uh, and their values have to be those of the legal elite, uh, uh, which must be special in the sense that, of course, there must be an emphasis on uh, honesty and the rule of law and uh, uh, being, uh, again, independent from outside pressures. Uh, of course, constitutional law can help to achieve that, but it's more a legal culture issue. And, and um, law, uh, constitutional law and legal culture can uh, do much to ensure the right mix of autonomy and accountability that have to shape uh, the way judges do their job. Mastering the law, uh, quite obvious uh, a feature, th that uh, I think uh, implies more precisely being creative about uh, the judge's work, which is uh, interpretation of the law. Uh, a judge should uh, use all accepted interpretation techniques to achieve uh, the right outcome. Uh, and I will go back to what right means in, in this context uh, later. Um, so in addition to that, mastering the law also means, uh, counterintuitively perhaps, not being captive to the uh, fascination of the law as a subject. It, it, it means being uh, aware that the law uh, is only uh, uh, only gets alive when applied to facts, and the better the match between the facts and the law, the better the judicial decision. Of course, this is costly, and so legal proceedings are very costly in countries where uh, jurisdiction works well. But uh, I, I think that is less of a problem for corporate litigation, of course. And, and, but it's something that uh, lawmakers sh should have in mind when deciding civil procedures rules and, and all access to justice rules, of course. And uh, finally, um, be mastering the law and, and their own functions means uh, being very careful about uh, how they make law, which, which they do, as I will say in a second, they uh, make law by uh, interpreting the law, and uh, they have to be very careful uh, in writing the, the holding of their decision, because they must be aware that the jury or de facto the, a decision is, uh, has a value as a precedent, and uh, the wider the precedent, the greater the impact, and it might be uh, a difficult uh, uh, exercise 
deciding how broad a precedent should be. Well, and, and then the most dif difficult uh, part, which is what it means to promote the social uh, good. As I said, uh, we can't be naive about separation of powers. Judges uh, inevitably uh, themselves make laws. They are also uh, social engineers or a particular kind of politicians because they allocate uh, um, goods uh, throughout uh, society with uh, their decisions. And, uh, and we shouldn't be blind about that. So what ultimate values and social goals guide them is uh, extremely relevant. And um, the laws and even the constitutions, uh, of course, uh, give them some guidance on what their uh, social uh, goals should be in exercising their uh, functions. But uh, it is always, or it is often at least, uh, incomplete uh, or insufficient guidance. There's always some room for maneuvering, whether because the law uh, is not entirely clear or because the law explicitly or implicitly allows for different goals to be pursued in, 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 the, in the interpretation of a given rule as the uh, uh, rationale for the rule. So there is uh, some rule for uh, residual, uh, quote unquote, social goals that judges are allowed or uh, perhaps well advised to consider uh, when they make decisions. Although, of course, these tend to be sector specific. So I will come back to this when I uh, deal specifically with uh, corporate law. And uh, going back to this idea that uh, they have to be to thread carefully in uh, uh, trying to decide individual cases in the right way, um, it is important for courts, of course, to decide rightly on an individual case, in, in a rightly meaning in a way that here that promotes social good, because this will uh, legitimize a court's uh, function. And, um, but still at the same time, and this is uh, something British judges are especially uh, conscious of, uh, aware of, legal certainty also is uh, important and similarly contributes to legitimizing courts. So it's important to, to have in mind that precedents do matter. Uh, the, the Latins used to say, or someone for them later, that in claris non fit interpretatio. We, in civil law countries, we tend to think that this uh, hardly matters, but, but still uh, one has to, to, to be aware that uh, one cannot completely disregard the wording of the law um, because, of, uh, because we live in democracies and, and, and while uh, parliaments are not always careful in the choice of words, still what they say has to matter uh, democratically. And, um, but, but still that there might be, that there is a broad uh, area, which is more or less gray, wh where uh, judges can uh, exercise their legal uh, creativity and uh, come up uh, with uh, better solutions for the individual case. Uh, and, and of course, in, in civil law jurisdictions, this is perhaps counterintuitive, but I think all of you who uh, um, come from civil law jurisdictions will, will find this familiar. The tendency is, in fact, for judges to be quite a lot, to, to have quite a lot of leeway in providing interpretations that not, do not necessarily conform with the letter of the law. I think that, that that's uh, good in some cases, but it, it something that should not be abused or used too, too uh, liberally. So um, the, the, the idea is that uh, a balance should be struck uh, between these two competing um, constraints, uh, and that should be done by focusing the judge's attention on the facts and shaping the ruling, the holding around those facts. What about the uh, corporate law judges more uh, specifically? So here, 
the, I, I used a, a strange meaning for integrity. Uh, of course, I, I take uh, honesty for uh, granted, but uh, uh, by I, integrity, I, I meant uh, the idea of serving society and, and not the other way around, not thinking that one is at the top of society and has to be served by, by lawyers, by citizens and so on. Um, and, and so uh, that means also understanding the functional nature of the law and specifically understanding the functional na nature of corporate law, uh, which in turn implies, and from, in the country where I come from, Italy, that's not definitely obvious, accepting that we live in a market economy and uh, markets uh, drive uh, the, the economy. Uh, exchange is the basis for how the economy works, uh, and uh, at least some degree of deference should be given uh, to uh, contracts, basically, and exchange, uh, because we, uh, the, the presumption should be, uh, and I say, uh, of course, uh, it's a winnable presumption, but the presumption should be that if two parties uh, enter into a contract, it means that they think that the contract makes them better off. Uh, and, and so it's not a zero or, or a negative sum gain. And, and of course, uh, and this is the most obvious thing I will say today, I hope economic literacy obviously helps. Knowing something about economics is uh, uh, a must for, for uh, a corporate law judge to do uh, her job well. Uh, what about independence here? It's uh, tricky uh, because the smaller, let's say, economically and, 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 and uh, um, physically a, a country uh, is, and the smaller its elite as a consequence is, the harder it is to compartmentalize the legal elite which uh, means that uh, judges will be less free of uh, pressures from the outside. And in the corporate law context, these outside pressures come from two sources. One is uh, politics, and that will be especially the case when uh, there is a mixed economy and some corporations are controlled by the state, but it can also be the controlling shareholders, which are uh, prevalent in most uh, jurisdictions. So there, there is a risk of capture uh, on the, uh, for judges on the part of powerful insiders. That is, uh, as I will argue later, bad. Um, what can uh, what can be used uh, to counter this risk uh, of uh, pressure from the outside? Uh, well, one may uh, hope that, uh, and one may, may posit actually, that uh, if the relevant judge has a sense of mission, thinks that what they are doing is important for the economy, and, and, and uh, has to be guarded as uh, an, an important economic function, then uh, the outside pressure should be lower. Th that means that uh, being a special purpose court, possibly a specialized corporate law court, may help. And we, we may see, in a way, Delaware as an example of this, because De Delaware is a small state, but it serves a much wider uh, market than Delaware, and, uh, and it is certainly clear that Delaware judges have a very strong sense of mission. What about mastering the law? There is the, the old saw that repetition is the key to success. This is true also for co corporate law judges. If they want to decide cases well, they have to have a heavy case law. They, they have to repeatedly decide corporate law cases. The more they decide, the better. Uh, and um, be, because there, uh, there will be uh, uh, 
uh, it will not be always the same people. Uh, there should be a, a panel of judges, not individual judges deciding cases, so that more experience goes into the mix uh, and in any decision. And uh, of course, uh, it is important, and nowadays uh, almost everywhere uh, uh, the case that that uh, cases uh, are easily available, easy to know, uh, and uh, easily uh, made available to to the public, to lawyers, and, and so on. Um, mastering the law also implies understanding the effects of the law and individual uh, holdings uh, on people's behavior. Again, given the fact that the law, the jure or de facto, everywhere uh, has value as a, a precedent, the, the, the case law, uh, judicial decisions. So judges, when uh, deciding an individual case, should, I think, ask themselves what implications uh, there will be if people will follow the, the dictum, will adapt to what the law requires them to do. But also that means uh, being aware that because people uh, tend to uh, avoid constraints that may be harmful to their welfare, then it will be rational for people to adapt uh, in the wrong way to the dictum that is engaging regulatory arbitrage, avoidance strategies, and so on. And, and so in shaping uh, um, a dictum, a holding, judges, judges should make these sort of considerations. And uh, on the one hand, uh, and given all the constraints of the case, of course, uh, provide for dicta that uh, will dictate uh, holdings that uh, will lead to the right behavior, but at the same time that will minimize the risk of uh, regulatory arbitrage or avoidance. And of course, this implies, uh, again, uh, exposures, uh, exposure knowledge of uh, economics uh, and, and finance. Uh, one needs not be a an economist or, or a financial economist to, to be a judge, but, but core intuitions from economics and, and finance will definitely help a judge uh, give better judgments. Uh, third point here, doctrinalism should be seen as a tool, not uh, the only tool, not a name for sure in itself shouldn't be the end of the story. And, and uh, actually, one may even argue, and I did that in my um, article almost 20 years ago, uh, that uh, there, sh there could be some form of functional doctrinalism. What, what I mean by that is that uh, doc doctrinalism is so rich, uh, we have to <laughs> recognize that, and allows for so much creativity that uh, a good judge will uh, be good enough to choose the right uh, line of argument and, 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 and the right co construction of the law in order to reach the right outcome and make it more acceptable also to uh, the, the legal community as a whole. So we, we should treat uh, uh, doctrinalism the same way as uh, um, Karl Kraus depicted prejudice a while ago. He said prejudice is an indispensable butler who keeps annoying impressions from entering our house, but we must avoid being thrown out of the house by our own butler. So, of course, in order for judges to perform this kind of uh, role and, and do these sort of things, it is important that the way they do it is accepted by the broader legal community. So lawyers themselves have to specialize and the richer account, the likelier that it is the case, that's the case. But also they should be uh, educated to share the same functionalist view of corporate law, which leads to um, the third leg, so to speak, for a, um, a 
uh, safe, uh, uh, healthy legal uh, culture, which is academia, we, which should similarly uh, be open-minded in terms of what the function of the law is and what uh, corporate law uh, is meant to uh, achieve, which is what, what I, um, I turn to now in my last uh, uh, five minutes or so. Um, of course, there might be legislations, even corporate law uh, statutes that clearly identify social goals other than uh, uh, we social welfare uh, for corporate law. But wh when that is not the case, when these uh, different social goals are not clearly identifiable, then corporate law uh, should be thought as thriving uh, to uh, facilitate uh, economic activity, facilitate growth, and, and it's, it's not about uh, a redistribution, as Easterbrook and Fischel uh, wrote in their uh, book uh, by now almost 30 years ago. So uh, the judges should be able to consider, whether explicitly or implicitly, but I would say also explicitly, the overall welfare effects of the legal interpretation that they give. And again, this implies having a, a, a good understanding, at least basic understanding, of economics and, fun, uh, and finance. What, 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 what does that mean more specifically? Uh, well, uh, people, uh, the, 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 the basic assumptions that, that uh, uh, are, uh, underlie economics and, and what may be sufficient to know about it for, for a judge uh, is that uh, uh, people are or tend to be rational and minimize negatives, uh, ne the negative effects of laws and other constraints on them. So judges should know that and avoid incentivizing avoidance with non-functional interpretations where possible, for example. So if you, if you say that uh, a phenomenon X is prohibited, but uh, you can achieve the same outcome as X with Y, perhaps as a judge, you, you should think twice about uh, what you, how you shape that uh, prohibition so as not to provide an incentive for, for, for people to do uh, why. That, that, that's something that could be done. Uh, corporations, uh, the, other, that, the other quite generic but be, be important insight from economics and finance is that corporations are effective tools to finance economic activities. That's pretty obvious. Schumpeter said that uh, uh, long ago. And, um, so rules that uh, lower financing costs without externalizing them uh, will be good um, because uh, uh, what uh, outside financiers get is what is left uh, following management by controllers, uh, preventing controllers from managing in a way that is, is akin to uh, stealing is intuitively wrong. So, emphasis should be given to how um, punish and therefore prevent stealing on the part of controllers. But at the same time, judges should be aware that the controller's power is not negative per se, and therefore when needed, it may itself des deserve some protection. And, um, and, and uh, in order to um, an understanding of uh, uh, un, uh, the underlying economics and finance uh, that, that is behind any economic decision, and therefore also behind any corporate decision, uh, is also necessary to get the facts uh, right. For example, uh, um, bad judges tend to uh, be unable to, to second guess uh, expert opinions for example, about valuation, whereas a good judge should, when needed, uh, try and form his or her own opinion about two, two contrasting expert opinion, for example, about the valuation of a, a company, an asset, etc. 
uh, they should also be able to understand the underlying business rationales of a transaction anytime the business judgment rule doesn't apply, uh, which is basically when uh, some uh, um, uh, when uh, violations of the duty of loyalty uh, are brought to, to the foreground. And, um, and so uh, this is very important. The getting facts right allows for greater fact specific specificity, which in turn allows for greater, greater justice of the individual case while adapting the precedent value of the individual decision. That is, there might be an individual situation where uh, the, the plaintiff uh, uh, deserves winning, but perhaps the law has to be tweaked a little bit in order to, to make uh, her a win. Uh, a good judge will make sure that the holding that uh, uh, comes from that decision will be extremely narrow. And, uh, and finally, an understanding of un the underlying economics and finance will uh, help uh, using what uh, Delaware practitioners used to call the smell test uh, within the boundaries of statutory law. Well, what, what is the smell test? It's the idea that a judge should be able to understand when there is something wrong in a transaction and basically find ways to uh, strike it down uh, whenever it uh, stinks badly enough. Uh, the last slide is just uh, um, a summary, so maybe I spoke enough, and uh, I will leave you the slide for a second, and, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, th thank you, Luca, for, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions uh, from your audience, if we, if we can take uh, some minutes from your time. Oh, sure, but it's uh, Amir's time, not mine. <laughs> Amir's time. Well, he starts in three minutes, so we, we have, I mean, like room for one or two questions. Um, I'll, I'll try to translate. Um, so uh, there's one here about something you included in one of your slides. You said judges, judges should be creative in order to achieve the right outcome. Um, but some economists say that the civil law judges toolbox is more limited. So here's the question. Do you think that judges in civil law jurisdictions are more constrained to be creative than their common law counterparts? No, actually, no. As I hinted during my presentation, I, I think it's quite the opposite. If you take uh, one of the most famous German cases, the Holzmüller case, the one that says that, um, you, you, that there are uh, limits to the freedom to contribute assets to a subsidiary in order to protect the rights of uh, minority shareholders in, in the parent company. And you see how the judges reach that conclusion. Basically, they say it's uh, the, the, the natural um, it, it's it's uh, <laughs> really they say we don't need to find a justification in the statute. We 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 as judges has the have the power to do that. And uh, and my my impression uh, so, so that that's an example. But uh, and of course I'm more familiar with the Italian law than any other law. But uh, what I see is that when judges have the motivation to be creative, they we, they have no absolutely no hesitation to uh, come up with solutions that are absolutely counterintuitive. And uh, my guess, uh, from the little I know about Latin America, is, is that that is the case there as well. You, you, well, that uh, may be the wrong uh, example, but Brazil for sure has very activist judges in all areas, including corporate law. Uh, the little I know about Colombia is the, the, the judiciary there is very powerful and I, I would be surprised if uh, there the were, the, the were no ways of using one of the many interpretation tools to achieve the outcome that for the specific case is the best one. Th thank you, Luca, for, for that answer. We actually have a number of questions, but we ran out of time. Uh, so I'll send them your way via email and I, I thank you once again for, for joining this conference. And, and now um, I'll introduce Amir. So take care, Luca. Nice seeing you.
Yo, I see you. Bye bye. Amir, are you online? I'm here. Oh, hi there. Hi. <clears throat> bueno, vamos a continuar entonces con la participación del profesor Amir Licht. Eh, Amir es profesor de Derecho Societario y Regulación del Mercado de Capitales en la Universidad de Herzliya en Tel Aviv, en la que también ocupó por algunos años el cargo de decano. El profesor Licht ha sido asesor del regulador bursátil y del Ministerio de Justicia en Israel. Es uno de los principales expertos israelíes en materia societaria, con aclamadas publicaciones sobre conflictos entre accionistas, gobierno corporativo y el impacto de factores culturales en la conducta de los administradores de sociedades abiertas. El profesor Licht nos va a hablar hoy acerca del funcionamiento de la Corte Especializada Societaria de Tel Aviv, una de apenas cuatro cortes societarias especializadas en el planeta, Delaware, Tel Aviv, Amsterdam y Colombia. Son los únicos lugares que tienen cortes de esta naturaleza y por eso le hemos pedido al profesor Licht que nos hable brevemente acerca de cómo funciona ese foro en Tel Aviv y qué impacto ha tenido en Israel. Profesor Licht, welcome uh, to Colombia. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, At the end of your talk, we'll probably send some questions your way, um, and uh, you have half an hour. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Professor Mendoza. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Let me share my slides. Um, just a moment. Right. Okay. Can you can you see my slides now? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so, again, thank you for the uh, the invitation. I'm, I plan to leave some time for uh, for questions uh, at the end. I hope we'll do we'll do well. The time will, will be enough. Uh, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of the economic division of uh, the Tel Aviv District Court, uh, one of the few, as Professor Mendoza mentioned, uh, specialized corporate uh, courts around around the world. Um, so I think you know by, by now that uh, there's a, like a fad or a, a, a lot of enthusiasm about business courts and specialized courts. They're, they're all the rage. Uh, we know all of them in many countries around the world. In most cases, they are specialized commercial courts or business-oriented courts. Uh, but as already uh, was mentioned, in, in a few countries, Colombia and Israel are among them, uh, there are specialized corporate or corporate securities courts. Uh, but clearly, the leader beyond, beyond dispute is, is the court that we see here, uh, the Chancery of Delaware. Uh, and the Chancery of Delaware, as Professor Lenik has also uh, mentioned, it's pretty much an agreement, is admired, even worshipped uh, among uh, lawyers and business people. Uh, you know, we, we turn to, to the Chancery of, of Delaware like it was the, the mecca of corporate law, also in not just the substantive law, but also uh, the, the, the adjudication. And what really is special, and is not in dispute uh, about the Chancery and the, the Delaware court system, it combines high quality uh, of, of lawmaking, I mean, justice making, administration of justice, uh, adjudication, high volume, uh, a lot of decisions, big transactions, also economic volume, and very high speed. I mean, the, the Chancellor of Delaware and the Vice Chancellor turn around uh, massive cases within within days. So this is like the model of a specialized corporate uh, system. What about the Israeli experience? Um, that's the topic of my, my presentation. Um, we, we talk about basically a division, a part of the uh, Tel Aviv District Court that was established or defined in uh, 10 years ago, in 2010. And this is, if I kind of to congest Summarize it, this is a story about a well-intentioned reform that, that went wrong. Uh, and the reason why it went wrong, at least to my mind, is because too many people were blinded by the Delaware appellation. Uh, and, and 
that's a lesson I, I would like to kind of examine or investigate during my, my presentation. Um, if we are to summarize the, the, the bottom line of this 10 year experience that is still going on, um, it turned out to be very good for lawyers. It is questionable in, in my mind, or at least arguable, uh, debatable, whether it was good for business, which is the constitu constituency that we are uh, to serve. Um, we have to begin it with a prehistory. And, and in our case, the prehistory begins in 1917. Uh, this is when Great Britain, towards the end of World War One, uh, conquered Palestine. You can see here in the picture, that's like an iconic image. Uh, you can see General Allenby, the, the commander of the British forces, entering the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem surrenders. Before 1917, uh, for 400 years, Palestine was ruled by the Ottoman Republic, by the Turks. Uh, but what followed is a period between 1922 and 1948 when Palestine was ruled uh, by the British uh, Empire, but not as a colony, but under a mandate from the League of Nations. Uh, the mandate was to establish a national home for, for the Jewish people. However, the British uh, treated Palestine like any other colony. I mean, they managed the country like they did uh, with uh, the rest of their uh, uh, territories. And one of the first things that they do and continued doing throughout their rule uh, was to establish a common law system in the, uh, in the country. And, and that system consists of primarily a court system. Uh, so we're, we are talking about a unified uh, system of common law and equity, uh, joint jurisdiction uh, in terms of uh, the court authority, a system that operates uh, according to the principle of uh, binding precedent, and crucially for the lawyers among you in the audience, uh, also uh, uh, followed English civil procedure. So the whole spirit, the, the, the legal culture of the system became gradually uh, uh, very English, very common lawish. In terms of substance, uh, they also gradually kind of replaced the entire substantive law of, of the country uh, with what you can think of as a codified version of the common law. So uh, the, the, the British Empire had like sets of statutes and prepared sets of statutes that codified uh, case law, uh, English case law. So we got a company statute and a tort statute and a criminal uh, law statute and so on and so forth. Basically a set of UK law during the 1920s, 1930s, until the, until the 40s. Uh, and in addition to that, it's not just that, that, not just that the country lived with the, those statutes, there was a constant reference to English case law as it developed. Uh, during, during that time. So it was like a satellite system of the British common law uh, system and, and the law itself. The formative years of, of Israel begin in 1948 when the state of Israel is established. And one of the very first things that the, the country did, the new uh, country did, you know, like within minutes since its establishment was to uh, pass a law that said the pre-existing law remained and remains remained. Uh, in force, including civil law, including pri private law, uh, that is. But, you know, the, the first decades, we're talking the 50s and, and the early 60s, were years when the country faced major security and economic challenges. I mean, you can see here in the picture, those were austerity years, post-war, and especially for a small country like, like Israel uh at the time for our purposes uh that meant that commercial law and, and corporate law uh was litigated at a very very low volume but amazingly enough what did come out from the courts um, in, in those early decades was was great stuff I and mean, when i look back at, at those decisions how they handle uh complex uh corporate cases not necessarily big transactions but but you know difficult legal issues uh, was very admirable. And, and the reason why that could happen is, again, echoes things that, uh, that Professor Enriquez uh, has mentioned, and I will get back to in, 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 a, in a way. Uh, we didn't coordinate, so I was, I was happy to listen to his lecture and see that he's kind of preparing the grounds. Uh, education, legal education. 
mastering the law uh, that, that was relevant for adjudicating uh, corporate, corporate cases, uh, corporate uh, disputes. Uh, the country developed until the 80s. I mean, the, the big turning point that, that is important for our purposes is the uh, mid to late 80s. It's a period of economic growth. Uh, commercial law develops uh, in, in parallel, and during that time, there's a, a regular reference to English law. So, so again, there was a lot of, I can't say bilateral exchange, because, you know, English judges don't read Hebrew. Uh, the, uh, you know, legal system in, in, in Israel uh, goes on and, you know, lives its life in, in Hebrew. But there was a, a lot of reference and a lot of uh, importation from English law. So by the mid to late 80s, Israeli uh, corporate law had all the major features of, uh, you know, any Eng English influenced uh, uh, company law system. So that, that would be like the UK, Australia, uh, Canada, New Zealand and stuff like that. Uh, so we're talking about a very developed body about the duty of loyalty. Um, a decent set of rules about the duty of care, as we know it in the business context, meaning uh, a doctrine that is roughly equivalent to the business judgment rule, not the Delawarean business judgment rule, but something quite along these uh, lines. Uh, a well-developed well body about oppression. So, so this is the major doctrine that serves to regulate uh, abusive power by controlling shareholders. Uh, and oppression, uh, oppression of the minority is the old doctrine. It was replaced in the 80s in the UK and shortly thereafter also in Israel with a kind of a more modern, more flexible, but essentially equivalent doctrine of unfair prejudice. Again, regulating the power or regulating the abuse of power uh, by controlling shareholders and crucially for uh, adjudication, derivative actions. So a, a, as you know, the big challenge in corporate law is how can you take the insiders, the powerful insiders, be they managers or controlling share shareholders, how you take them to court, how you bring them to justice. And the answer that uh, the common law system, primarily the English system, develop, has developed is the derivative action. And uh, Israel followed the, the same body of, of law and the same doctrine developed in Israel. What we didn't have uh, until pretty late, until the late 80s, was class actions. Uh, again, that's a con that was a consequence of our UK heritage. Uh, UK law doesn't like uh, class actions. It doesn't have class actions to this day. Uh, in fact, there's some, some, some substitute that was developed just, just recently. Uh, so this as you can understand, uh, this puts a hurdle to any kind of mass uh, mass thoughts, including securities uh, securities litigation. So, like to summarize, the, the body of law at the 80s, turning into the early 90s, uh, substantive law was in very good shape. But because there was relatively low litigation volume, uh, we had like seminal cases and major principles, but not a lot of detailed uh, rulings and virtually no securities litigation and virtually no securities law uh, to speak of at the time. Now comes the big leap. Um, between the 1990s and the, uh, the 2000s, uh, the, the Israeli economy and the Israeli market economy uh, uh, developed very rapidly. The stock market grew uh, uh, very su substantially. And probably the most important economic development was the emergence of the high sector, uh, high, high tech sector. Um, and it boomed. It boomed. Uh, in a very important way, um, there were big transactions by that time, uh, a lot of international investment uh, flowing in into, into private companies, and an important development that also kind of bears on our, on our topic is, was that literally dozens, we're talking about dozens of Israeli companies that went to the NASDAQ and listed, mostly the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, uh, listed their shares on, on American markets and kind of created a bridge and a channel of influence uh, from the US, primarily in terms of, of uh, securities regulation law, but also in terms of opening to, uh, to Delaware law, to corporate law. Um, also in the late 90s, mid 90s, uh, 
through legislation, a, a mechanism of securities class action was introduced, but they were relatively few uh, at day time. They grew in number on, only later. Um, the courts, however, were slow to develop to, to, to respond to uh, to these developments, uh, and and now you can see the seeds where when and where the seeds for the development of the uh, the establishment of the economic division uh, were sown. Uh, those proceedings, the, the, that litigation that did take place, tended to be lengthy. Uh, we're talking about many months and usually a good number of years. Uh, like the, the most famous the securities class action litigation took uh, overall took uh, some 15 years uh, to resolve. Uh, and, and, you know, a couple of years was like the average time for a corporate case uh, to litigate. And that created some frustration. Now, probably, and this is my interpretation, but I think most people would, would agree uh, with that. The most important factor that pushed for the establishment of the specialized court was actually the securities authority. It was the government and the specialized uh, securities regulator that I can say, I mean, IT securities regulation, and, and they suffered the number of embarrassing setbacks uh, in, during the 1990s and, and early 2000s. Uh, clearly silly mistakes by, by inexperienced judges, uh, not that many. Uh, but 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 upsetting for the uh, for a securities regulator with a you know with an ethos of professionalism. So there was a sense of frustration also in the government with the uh, with the performance of the Tel Aviv District Court, which is you know most of the economic activity in Israel is concentrates in the uh, Tel Aviv region, the Greater Tel Aviv region. So the Tel Aviv District Court pretty much uh, uh, dominates uh, business litigation. Uh, at the same time. Because the statute, the, the company statutes by the, you know, by the late 90s was, was, was like 70 years old. Uh, it was introduced by the, uh, by the British rulers in, in 1929, was amended a number of times, it's not, not modernized. There were calls, many calls from the business sector to modernize. Uh, and, and to have uh, judges with more business expertise. And, and in general, people said, be like Delaware. Let us be like Delaware. Look at Delaware, see how they do it, and let's do it. Let's do the same uh, over here. Now, here in parentheses, you can see, uh, I mean, you don't have to be cynical uh, to, be, you know, to be suspicious. Uh, so there are always private interests. Uh, they, they cannot be ignored. Uh, one can tell a story of you know a public choice kind of kind of story how you know well organized business uh, business groups or interest groups uh, uh, shape or affect uh, uh, the development of the law. I can't prove that. I have my own theories. These are not conspiracy theories. These are you know ideas about people who are or sectors who have an interest in uh, certain developments in the law. Keep, the, keep that in mind, okay? This came up also in Professor Onikis' uh, uh, lecture, and it cannot be ignored. The big div event was in 19, uh, 2010 when uh, the economic division of the Tel Aviv District Court was established. I mean, it's not a new court, right? It's just a division uh, within the district court that oversees all of the uh, litigation in, in the district. Basically, three promising, um, I mean, brighter than, than average, but not, you know, the best, not necessarily the best and brightest, but clearly prominent, promising uh, judges were identified and they were allocated to this uh, new division. And that division, through a legal amendment uh, in, in the, uh, you know, basically civil procedure statute, uh, had jurisdiction uh, over corporate and securities cases, including criminal uh, securities cases, I mean, public enforcement uh, of the securities law. And the idea was that these three guys, these three judges will specialize, will gain expertise, uh, they will become more familiar with, you know, financial economics of big transactions and so on, all the issues that Professor Enriquez uh, also mentioned. And, and the media celebrated, uh, you can see here in, in, you know, in quotation marks, from Delaware to Tel Aviv. So Delaware was the model uh, the, 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 
thing to be followed, the, the example to be followed. At the same time, you know, an unrelated development, but took place at the same time, uh, because there was a lot of, uh, you know, the caseload in the Tel Aviv district was uh, was very heavy. Um, another district was was established, it's called the Central District Court, with overlapping territorial jurisdiction. So there was like competition. You could choose uh, where to fight, whether in the Tel Aviv District Court, you know, like a corporate or securities case, and that would go to the economic division, the specialized panel, the specialized court, or you could file to the central district court, and then what would likely happen and did happen uh, is that basically two judges, uh, one of them exceptionally brilliant, now uh, sits at the Supreme Court, another one very experienced, kind of a seasoned common law judge, uh, and and they, you know, not by design, but by, by coincidence, serve as a control group for the uh, for the economic division. Uh, what happened? How am I on time? Okay. Um, in terms of performance, uh, like, you know, technical, rough, you know, dry numbers, by impression, if you ask, you know, the, 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 the lay business person who, you know, is familiar with the issues, the business community is happy. Uh, the, there is the, the image, the public image that, you know, businesses served. Uh, we have like expert judges who sit and dispense, you know, justice uh, in complex cases. The media in particular is happy about the economic division. So they, they have a very good, very positive public image. Uh, when you look at the numbers more carefully, the picture is more balanced, I should say. There's a study by Fataran, a Stanford Law graduate, that was done in uh, 2016. So it was done after five years. That's a caveat, but this is what we have. It's a very careful study about, you know, the development of cases in the economic division. And what she found is that essentially cases took about the same time, about the same time as before. So there was not much of change uh, in comparison to the period before uh, the specialized court or the specialized division was, was established, and also roughly similar to the quote-unquote control group, the, the central district. Why? How come? What she offers as an explanation, I think it's very convincing, uh, at least to me, is the like a simple economic uh, mechanism in, in, in place. So there was an increase in the supply of adjudication services, which comes, you know, is followed quite quickly with increase in the demand for litigation services. And the whole system ends up in roughly the same equilibrium price if you uh, think about litigation costs as the equilibrium price. So it's, you know, it's like it's like the government building a new road. You know, quite quickly, uh, people understand that there's, you know, the, there's a broader road, so they buy more new cars and you end up getting stuck in the morning traffic just as you did before the new road was built. This is basically the same, uh, the same story. So this moves us, uh, should shift our, our, our attention to the question of quality. Did, did quality improve? And here, here I would like to put the argument, uh, and, and, and I'm... I'm I'm sad. I, mean, I'm, 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 I regret that I have to put it like that, but that, that's my view. That substantive law, the quality of the law, actually deteriorated in several core issues. Now, when I prepared this, this presentation, I debated how much I want to get you into the detail. I de decided I'm not going to get you into any doctrinal details of Israeli law. So I'll just you know, refer to some headlines. So when you look at the core, the, the, most, uh, the central tenet of, of company law, and we think about the duty of loyalty, um, basically, the economic division, the specialized court, discarded, did away with a fundamental principle of fiduciary law, which is uh, fully informed consent. That's FIC there, fully informed. A breach of a fiduciary can be excused only through fully informed consent. consent. And they did away with that. What came in, 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 in lieu of that? The division adopted something that was purported to be a version of the standards of review of the Delaware uh, of Delaware law, about which we will hear from uh, Professor Hammermesh. But I put these, you know, between quotation marks because because I regret to say, I'm afraid to say that Professor Hammermesh will may not recognize the way 
the Israeli uh, specialized court kind of talks about the standards of review. Also, they gave wrong remedies. Uh, so, so these are doctrinal mistakes that, that should, shouldn't be there, okay? Shouldn't, shouldn't have happened. Uh, there are problems also with the adjudication of duty of care cases. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the division kind of introduced uh, to Israeli law the business judgment rule, again, with a strong Delaware uh, influence. But here again, uh, as I mentioned, we already had a, a version, actually a legislative version of a business judgment rule. And at the same time, time you know, a court that was supposed to be uh, imitating Delaware uh, was doing substantive review of business decisions. That, that's a known. Um, let me, and for the interest of time, let me skip about the skip the special litigation committees. That that's another uh, story. But what is important is that in many cases the uh, specialized court invokes Delaware law. This is how it's done in Delaware. We're going to do the same. This is uh, how did the Delaware Delawareans do that. We're going to do uh, the same. Notwithstanding the fact that in cer certain cases, the Israeli legislation, the statutes, says something different. And quite, you know, every once in a while, established principles of English law in Israeli law say something different, and oh, maybe even in Delaware. A disturbing feature of this, this trend or this development is that the Supreme Court tend to actually to defer to the business to the uh, to the district court. So the Supreme, the higher uh, instance in the system, actually gives a lot of deference to the specialized court. And that's a big question why. In summary, corporate law, I think, even if you don't buy into this, you know, better or worse became more confused. Corporate law, our corporate law after 10 years became much more confused. So there's more rather than less litigation. And surely the lawyers are happy, but I'm not sure that business people should be happy. Let me summarize with, with some, some brief lessons, um, some, some insights. Again, these are my views. You could hear other views. The first is maybe obvious, but it does have, have force here. There's no silver bullet. If you want to kind of a, upgrade your uh, uh, corporate law, adjudica corporate adjudication or, or corporate cases uh, adjudication, there's no quick fix through some, you know, let's establish a little court and they will do just that. In fact, the Israeli uh, uh, experience tells you that things can actually get worse. And you have to be very careful about that. And here it's important for me to emphasize that all of that was very, very well intentioned. I mean, the court system in Israel is very clean I mean, in terms of absence of corruption. Local government may not be that clean, but the court system is at a very high level of, of integrity. So this is done for good reasons, uh, so to speak. Another uh, lesson, imitation is difficult. I mean, you want to follow the leader, you want to learn from the experience of the, you know, of the leaders. You can adopt, including from Delaware, but you will have to adapt uh, according to the local to the local needs. So the example that I give to my students usually is that it's very difficult. It's hard to upgrade a non-US car with US car parts. So suppose we have like, you know, a nice, you know, a, a Jaguar car from the 80s that's still running well, but could use some, some upgrades. You're not going to do anything good if you use car parts from a Chevy Corvette. Like a Chevy Corvette is a fine car, but its parts don't, you know, interact well with the old English cars. So there's a way to do that. A lot is needed. And I'll finish with a point that uh, Professor Enrique has mentioned more than once. A lot, mastering the law is key. Uh, it takes a lot of legal education, not just the judges, but the entire legal community to be able to argue cases, to design transactions in a way that would be litigated later on uh, in a way that is consistent with the way you want the, you want the law uh, to operate. That's it. Do we have time for questions? Thank you so much, Amir. That, that was extremely interesting. We actually have a couple of questions, but only one minute before Larry set to start. Um, so I'll, I'll just pick some one question randomly. Let me, let me check it. Uh, OK, here's one. Um, do you think that there should should also be a specialized court of appeals above the economic uh, district court. And, and I'll complement it. 
Um, do you think that may be a remedy to correct some of these deficiencies you have noted in, in the decision making process and the presence of, of the economic division? Um, that's a that's a very nice that's a very good question. Um, there's there's not a good reason uh, to bypass the Supreme Court. Um, I think the key point here is to uh, keep studying the law, uh, regaining the expertise that was in existence. That that's the the, the big mystery. Uh, let me remind you: the early judges were true experts in in company law. Uh, the kind of expertise that you see today uh, among English uh, judges. So I would not kind of bypass or replace uh, the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, despite like the, 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 you know, like gloomy atmosphere of my, uh, of my presentation, I'm actually optimistic. I mean, that's the power of a common law system. It has this tendency to correct to correct its own uh, its own mistakes. So I think that over time, people will realize that, you know, Delaware is fantastic, but you need to use these like US car parts in a way that is consistent and compatible with the working of, of a legal system that is primarily English structured. Fantastic, Amir, thank you uh, once again for your time. Now, now we're very pleased to welcome Professor Larry Hammermesh. Larry, nice to see you again. Delighted to see you. Uh, oh, it's a oh, oh, sorry. I'll, I'm going to make a short introduction. Oh, uh, go right ahead. Yeah. And then just hand it over to you. <clears throat> Muy bien. Um, vamos a seguir ahora con el profesor Larry Hammermesh. El profesor Hammermesh es el director ejecutivo del Centro de Estudios en Derecho y Economía de la Universidad de Pensilvania y profesor emérito de la Universidad de Widener en Delaware. Desde el año 1995, el profesor Hammermesh ha formado parte de la Comisión de Reforma Legal del Estado de Delaware, el cuerpo colegiado que tiene a su cargo la curaduría del sistema societario más sofisticado del planeta. Eh, como lo mencionaron hace algún rato, eh, las leyes en Delaware se... Eh, actualizan todos los años. Es un proceso constante, gradual de mejora legislativa. El profesor Hammermesh ha estado en el centro de ese proceso eh, desde el año 1995. También ha participado en la preparación de las leyes modelo en materia societaria que publica la Asociación de Abogados Estadounidenses. Eh, por último, y conociendo a Larry, tal vez lo más importante para él, el profesor Hammermesh es miembro de la Junta Directiva de la Escuela de Música de Delaware. Eh, nos va a hablar hoy el profesor Hammermesh acerca de los estándares de revisión judicial que usa la Corte de Cancillería de Delaware para saber qué operaciones con accionistas controlantes son buenas y cuáles son malas. Welcome, Larry, to what I believe is your third time in Colombia. It is, and it's a pleasure to, uh, to work with you again, Jose Miguel. It's also a great honor to follow, and, and maybe a burden to follow two such distinguished scholars as Professor Enriquez and, and Professor Licht, uh, both of whom seem to know as much about Delaware as I do, uh, plus a lot more. Uh, but I'll see if I can add anything to their very uh, compelling presentations. Uh, to, to get that going, uh, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, Not having luck with that right now. Does that work, by the way, Jose Miguel? Uh, we can't see it yet, but uh, we have time for you to keep trying. So, all right. <laughs> I am. Uh, Clicking on the share uh, yeah. button on my screen, uh, but don't see a good place to go from there. Right. Um, if you maximize your PowerPoint slide, so so yes. just bring up and now try share again. All right. 
right? Say something when it comes, if it comes up. Yeah. We good? Uh, nope. Uh, Mm -mm. Any luck yet? Nope. No. Nope. <laughs> You'll hear me screaming in joy when, when it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. Uh, no, don't worry about it. It's it, it's well, I, I'm not going to waste people's time any further, um, uh, and I'm very sorry uh, not to be able to share the slides, uh, but I'll try to talk slowly enough so that uh, uh, they'll be understandable, and I'm happy to forward them to anybody who wants to see them. Larry, um, if, if you want, I can share them for you, and if you uh, give me instructions, I'll change the slide. That would be good, too. Yeah, let me do that, but you can just start talking. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, and the the first slide when it comes up uh, is something I rarely do as a law professor, which is get to the point right away uh, and tell you what I really uh, am trying to get across. Uh, all of the uh, presentations this morning are about uh, the mechanisms for enforcing corporate law in a way that is socially productive. Uh, my central claim is that um, uh, and you can move to the, the next slide, uh, is that uh, the enforcement of corporate law is a public good uh, that promotes commercial predictability. Uh, it enables people to plan uh, and uh, to do so in a way that is consistent with uh, overall value maximizing behavior. Uh, it depends, however, on uh, being able to make the world aware, or at least the relevant part of the world aware of the rules and how they're enforced uh, as so as to guide uh, future business conduct. And as a result, uh, I maintain that public enforcement of corporate law uh, deserves public support uh, as, as we've seen uh, in Israel uh, and, uh, and in Colombia for that matter. Uh, in Delaware, uh, it has uh, an interesting source of public support. Um, uh, Delaware is just one and very small state, uh, but corporations that uh, establish themselves in Delaware uh, are required to pay what's called a, a franchise tax, which varies largely according to the size of the company. Uh, but uh, uh, in the larger uh, corporations, uh, comes to sink on the order of $250,000 US dollars uh, a year. And that fund makes up a substantial part of the state's budget and uh, supports this mechanism, this institution for public enforcement of corporate law. Uh, so the next slide is just a very brief uh, review of what corporate law actually enforces. So if you'll move to the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, we're talking about enforcement of the obligations uh, from whatever source, principally common law, of corporate directors, officers, and controlling stockholders. And in practice, this is largely the duty of loyalty uh, and has its greatest impact in regard to related party transactions. Uh, in the United States, this is oddly simply a matter of state law, and there are 50 states plus the District of Columbia that each have their own corporate law. Uh, but Delaware's is, as has been said, the, the dominant uh, body of law in, in the United States. Um, and the duty of loyalty is entirely the creature of judicial imagination and application. Uh, in Delaware, at least, there is no statutory uh, foundation for the duty of loyalty is purely a common law creation. Uh, and as applied, uh, and Professor Lick uh, referred to this, 
uh, there are various levels of intensity with which Delaware judges will look at uh, challenged transactions. Uh, the baseline, the default, if you will, is uh, the business judgment rule, which in Delaware simply means that if there is a product or a transaction that is the product of ordinary director approval, uh, then any rational justification will validate the transaction, uh, which basically makes it impossible to challenge in litigation and uh, results in typically throwing out the case before any great amount is spent on uh, discovery and other litigation practice, let alone trial. Uh, so a very deferential standard. And at the other end of the spectrum is the most intensive level of scrutiny, which in Delaware is called entire fairness review. Uh, and that's a scrutiny that's reserved for transactions, which are the product of decision makers who are who suffer from a conflict of interest, where that conflict of interest has not been uh, overcome and the transaction has not been validated by independent and disinterested uh, corporate actors. Uh, in entire fairness uh, review, uh, the person who is defending a transaction bears the burden of demonstrating that it's fair in all of its aspects, procedural and economic. Uh, and when that standard of review, uh, that intensive level of scrutiny applies, uh, full trial and discovery and all the expense that Professor Enriquez referred to is necessary. There's also a considerable level of uncertainty, which means as a bottom line that nobody wants to be in that soup. Uh, and there is a very strong incentive to avoid entire fairness uh, review. So who does this enforcement? Uh, next slide, we'll show you that, as you know, it's the Court of Chancery. There is an appellate court that supervises the Court of Chancery. It's our Delaware Supreme Court. But the Court of Chancery is uh, on the front line. It's the trial court that uh, sees and decides most of these cases. It is a very odd institution, a, a, a historical anachronism, really. Uh, there was a period in England uh, going back 400 or 500 years where there were separate law courts and separate equity courts. And that system was transported to uh, the, uh, well, then the colonies, became the United States. Uh, and most states abandoned that separation in the early 1800s. Uh, Delaware, for reasons that I actually don't even know, kept it. Uh, but it was a fortuitous, very happy accident that Delaware did that because the Court of Chancery has become critical in establishing the reputation that Professor Enriquez and Professor Licht were so generous in discussing. Uh, and so I, I thought I would touch for a few minutes in the next slide about why the Court of Chancery has been as successful as it has been. Uh, Professor Enriquez very prudently uh, and perceptively anticipated the first one. Uh, as a court of equity, historically, uh, the Court of Chancery has had a very limited scope of jurisdiction. It handles corporate cases and it handles trust cases and guardianships. Uh, but basically, it handles cases that have some fiduciary uh, content. Uh, where there is fiduciary conduct to be evaluated. Doesn't handle criminal cases at all. Uh, doesn't handle ordinary tort cases, uh, debt collection cases, uh, and therefore has a very concentrated uh, body of uh, uh, cases on its docket. The result is specialization, uh, and that specialization exposes the members of the Court of Chancery to a rich diet of business law education uh, and experience. And as Professor Enriquez correctly observed, that's been an important reason for the court's ability to handle cases as expeditiously and sensibly as it has. And by the way, I don't agree with every ruling of the Court of Chancery. 
Um, nor do I agree with every ruling of the Delaware Supreme Court, and they don't always agree with each other. But on balance, they do a pretty good job. Uh, one of the contributors to the predictability, the predictive value of litigation in the Court of Chance is that unlike many courts in the United States, there is no jury. That's part of the historical accident of uh, its heritage from England. Uh, uh, there is no jury, so uh, the decision-making doesn't go into a, uh, an impregnable black box uh, whose reasoning you can't really see. There are also no punitive damages allowed uh, in the Court of Chancery. Again, that drawing on its equity uh, history. And that contributes to uh, a great deal of the comfort level on the part of business participants with the court. Another element, really interesting one at the moment, is uh, one that doesn't go quite as far back, but in the late 1800s, uh, the uh, Delaware General Assembly adopted a provision that requires uh, that the members of the Court of Chancery, and I'm simplifying a little bit, but that the members of the Court of Chancery uh, be no more than a majority from one political party and the remainder being from the other political party. And as I'm sure you all hear, with Democrats and Republicans being at each other's throats these days, the idea of enforcing political balance is uh, an interesting choice. Uh, and uh, it does contribute to the independence uh, of the Court of Chancery and its members in ways that Professor Enrique suggested. There is currently a case that's going to be heard on October 5th in the United States Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of that political balance requirement. Uh, and so far, the lower courts have invalidated it as an improper political requirement. Uh, one of the exceptions to the rule that prohibits that kind of political requirement is a rule that says that if the officer in question is one who serves a political or policy-making function, then that uh, political balance or political tests are appropriate. So it's very interesting for me to hear Professor Enriquez talk about judges correctly, I think, as having a policy-making role. And Honestly, I expect that the U.S. Supreme Court will reverse and reinstate and validate this balance requirement, but I'm not always very good at predicting judicial outcomes, so we'll see. Uh, the next element of the Court of Chancery's success is what I call its public-facing character. Uh, it invariably decides cases through reasoned opinions and most often they are written opinions. Uh, so the whole world can see what the court is thinking and why the court reached the decision it did. Uh, that alone uh, compares favorably to the sort of uh, confidential world of arbitration where you don't necessarily even hear the outcome, let alone find out why an outcome was reached. Uh, Another thing that Professor Enriquez mentioned that's relevant here is the sense of mission that members of the Delaware Court of Chancery feel. Uh, they are stewards. They perceive themselves as having a stewardship responsibility. And as a result, they participate actively in public discourse uh, with bar association programs, with continuing legal education programs, writing and law reviews, uh, and again, this compares uh, differently with arbitrators who largely function quietly and confidentially, sometimes for good reasons, uh, but it's a very different system. Uh, and the last reason for the Court of Chancery success is one of those car parts, to use Professor Lick's very nice analogy, that's hard to transplant, and that is a private enforcement infrastructure with incentives uh, that will drive cases in appropriate directions. Uh, there is a very well-developed class and derivative plaintiff's bar, uh, institutional plaintiff's bar, uh, that has a very significant presence in Delaware. And the carrot that 
moves the horse forward is the prospect of an award of fees in the event of a successful recovery. Uh, the Delaware courts uh, can be very generous uh, in awarding fees. The most well-known fee award was won, say, about six or seven years ago in a class action, uh, or rather a derivative suit, in which the recovery was about $2 billion, uh, and the fee award was a little over $300 million. Uh, uh, I, I know some of the people involved in that case, and they still uh, are very generous contributors to some of my uh, nonprofit causes, uh, and so I have a separate reason to be grateful for these incentives. But the larger public reason for being grateful is that that incentive system is what enables uh, the uh, the Court of Chancery to have the diet of cases uh, that contribute to public learning about how business ought to be conducted. Uh, so the next slide, uh, much more quickly, we'll review the uh, benefits of this system. And as I said, basically, we're talking about a system in which the courts convey a set of rules that will guide business planning, transactional planning, improve predictability, and do so in a way that balances the cost of a litigation-based system, which are substantial costs, with enhanced commercial confidence. Uh, and that system is one that uh, has been known to fail on times, but uh, overall works very well. I thought in the time remaining, uh, as we'll see on the next slide uh, or two, I, I'll give an example of how this system has, has worked, um, and partic in particular, how it has governed uh, mergers that are accomplished by controlling stockholders, usually where controlling stockholders essentially buy out, forcibly buy out the minorities' uh, stockholders' shares. Uh, going back to the year of my birth in 1952, uh, there, was, uh, there has been traditional doctrine that says simply that where you have a transaction like that, a controller stockholder transaction, that entire fairness standard applies. Uh, and yet, uh, there was case law that said that disinterested stockholder approval, approval by the minority, would restore that judicial deference associated with the business judgment rule. Uh, that was how we loosely understood the law until 1983, uh, when, when the Delaware Supreme Court decided the very well-known case of Weinberger versus UOP. And by the way, uh, uh, the uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School uh, has a website uh, that contains oral histories of some of these cases. And in the next month or so, we're going to be releasing a documentary video about the UOP case told from the perspective of people who were involved in the case. It's been a very interesting project, and there are some other case, famous cases that are the subject of documentaries. But the UOP case uh, restated the entire fairness doctrine, but made a suggestion that maybe the result would have been different if a special committee of disinterested directors had been charged with negotiating with the controlling stockholder. Well, it didn't take practitioners long, long to, and they started to create these special committees in such transactions. Uh, and the question was whether or not the use of such committee would restore the business judgment rule, deferential review. Uh, uh, 12 years later, the Delaware Supreme Court decided a case called Kahn versus Lynch, uh, which had resolved a previous split when decisions within the court of chancery. And it said that Yes, the special committee process will shift the burden of proof, but it doesn't restore the business judgment rule. You still have to decide whether or not the trend was fair. In other words, you have to go through discovery. You have to go through a full-blown trial. There's still uncertainty. So it didn't really accomplish much, the special committee technique. And during the 10 or 15 years after Kahn versus Lynch, there was this well-known, I'll just call it an abuse, uh, the Court of Chancery called it a kabuki dance at one point, where plaintiff's counsel would see that a con controlling stockholder was proposing a, trans a freeze-out merger, would bring a lawsuit even before the special committee did anything, and then when the special committee negotiated a bump in the price, the 
plaintiff's lawyers would take credit for it, and the defense lawyers would say, sure, we'll give you credit as long as we get to dismiss the case without going through all this discovery and trial. And so plaintiff's lawyers were getting very substantial fees for essentially doing nothing. Uh, and it's kept happening over and over again because there, there was really no good way to follow rules and get rid of or prevent litigation like that uh, at the outset. And this generated some significant academic criticism uh, and some rethinking from opinions in the Court of Chancery uh, in the CNX case and uh, uh, Cox Communications cases in uh, uh, 2010 and 2005. Uh, but this all came to a head a few years later, and now for the next slide, uh, in a case uh, called MNF Worldwide or MFW, uh, where the Court of Chancery in the Delaware Supreme Court engaged in what I think was a classic example of Professor Enriquez's uh, model of how a court ought to behave. The court took stock of all the past doctrine and said, what kind of doctrine do we want to create that will actually encourage people to behave in the right way and will minimize the bad impact of litigation while preserving the good impact? And what the court did was say, if you're a controlling stockholder and you want to do a freeze out, what you ought to do is use both a special committee of disinterested independent directors and seek the approval of disinterested stockholders and condition your unwaverably from the beginning on both approvals. In other words, each group, each independent disinterested group will have a veto. And because that most closely resembles the requirements applicable to arm's length mergers, that will restore business judgment rule protection. And the transactional effect of this ruling has been exactly what the Delaware courts predicted. Those who have been planning transactions like this have said, okay, uh, except in rare circumstances where there is a, uh, a contentious stockholder with a large block, uh, the planners will say, sure, let's have both a special committee and a disinterested stockholder vote uh, and avoid litigation, avoid expensive litigation, avoid an expensive settlement with plaintiff's counsel who don't really contribute anything. Let's let these private mechanisms work. And this is a classic example of how the development of common law has brought with it uh, a refinement in how the spectators to that system behave. Those who never have to bear the costs of litigation and the court system nonetheless benefit from it uh, because they've been guided by decisions that emerge from uh, the judicial system. And that goes back to establishing the basic point I made about corporate law and corporate law enforcement being a public good. And with that, I'm happy to yield my last two minutes to any number of questions that we can get in. And thank you, Jose Miguel, again, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, th thank you, Larry, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we do have uh, a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with uh, an easy one. Um, so uh, the question has to do with the entire fairness test. So uh, as we gathered from your presentation, uh, no one wants to bear the expense and the time of going through discovery and the full trial. Um, but that in practice means that uh, entire fairness is a difficult process. So how does it work in practice? Who actually bears the burden of proof uh, if the defendant has to show that a transaction was conducted under entire fairness? Is it the controlling shareholder? Is it the company itself? Um, how is the burden usually met? I mean, just give us a, an idea sure. of working practice. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, the entire fairness burden rests on the proponent of the transaction. Uh, where we're talking about a freeze-out merger, it would be upon the controller and the controller's representatives on the board of directors. They would have to establish the fairness of the transaction. But it's not impossible. Uh, there was a case oh, I'd say about 10 years ago, called Trados, where uh, 
the preferred stockholders uh, controlled the board and they implemented a merger which uh, resulted in the common stockholders receiving zero, nothing for their shares. Of course, the common stockholders were not happy about this. They brought a class action. And after a long trial, because entire fairness was uh, the governing standard, the Court of Chancery said, you know what? The common stock under the circumstances was in fact worthless, worth zero. So the transaction was fair. It was not done well. Procedurally, it was ugly, but it was fair. But the proponents, the preferred stockholders who controlled the transaction, had to go through all kinds of burdens, costs, years of litigation to get to that result. Right, right. Thank you. And one final question, because we've run out of time. Um, how, how do you pick chancellors for the Court of Chancery in Delaware? Uh, great question. Uh, the chancellors are appointed by the governor of Delaware, uh, but the governor of Delaware relies on something called a judicial nominating commission, which is composed of uh, lawyers and, uh, and non-lawyers from the community who uh, review the qualifications of various judges and typically send the governor three names when there is a vacancy. Uh, where the political balance requirement applies, the one, uh, they'll of course pick a Democrat or a Republican as the case may be or names of Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the governor is also very thoroughly advised by people who are familiar with the courts and the law in Delaware and has managed to make a very good record of creating or picking judges who are hardworking and uh, experienced. And if they aren't experienced when they start, they get it very quickly once they get there. But is there a track record requirement? Like you have to have practice for 20 years before you can, oh, right. No, no such requirement. Uh, uh, if There's actually a very funny uh, video on that website I mentioned of an interview with the judge who decided the UOP case in the Court of Chancery, Grover Brown. And he describes for about 10 minutes about how he became a judge. Uh, he'll be quick to say he didn't know anything about corporate law when he started. <laughs> Uh, but he learned very quickly, and I can vouch for that personally, because he was hardworking and practical and thoughtful, and uh, he more than made up for his lack of sophistication before he got to the court uh, once he got there. Okay, Larry, thank you so much. Uh, we you. ran out of time. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Amir, and thank you, Luke. I see you're still here. Um, it was uh, great hearing your opinions on this matter. And then I'll switch to Spanish. Uh, to announce next week's event. Uh, thank you all so much. Bueno, pues muy, muy, muchas gracias a todos por su participación y por su atención. Recuerden que la próxima semana, el miércoles, comenzando también a las ocho y cuarto, tendremos un grupo de practicantes, de litigantes, expertos, que eh, litigan con alguna frecuencia ante la Corte de Cancillería de Delaware, ante el Tribunal Especializado de Tel Aviv y ante la Corte Especializada de Ámsterdam. No se lo pierdan, nos vemos en una semana.